Well, welcome this week to A Case for America. This is Austin Hepworth. Uh, I'm an attorney licensed in Utah and California, and we're also here with Michael Hepworth, um, a data and numbers guy, to talk about something that we're passionate about, which is America and what makes America the land that it is. We believe strongly that America is great because it's built on certain principles, ideologies, and beliefs. And we feel strongly that if America continues to embrace those, that we will continue to thrive as a country. But if we depart from those, we're at serious risk of uh, losing a lot of the prosperity, a lot of the blessings, a lot of the things associated with our country. And so today, we wanted to talk a little bit more about law, government, some of these important pieces to define a little bit further of what we're talking about, what we're looking at, and what we believe. And so as part of that, we have this picture for those that are just listening and can't see this. It looks like a seesaw. There's a uh, point in the middle, and there's that board across where it's balanced. And the point in the middle, we define as liberty. On the left side of this, there's anarchy, which is a state of no law. And on the right side of this, there's tyranny, which we define as a state of complete rule by law. There's nothing else going on, um, no individual decisions. Now, in a state of anarchy or tyranny, sometimes it's a little theoretical because you may never fully reach those places where there's no law or where there's all law. Um, but certainly, we feel strongly that the proper role of government is to really push society or help society be at this place of liberty, where there's a balance, where we've created enough of a structure, enough of a system for people to interact together, to people to be a community, to live together, to create things, but where we preserve certain aspects of what it means to be an individual, to be able to decide things for yourself. And we feel that if there's too few laws, then society will be somewhat in chaos. Things won't work as they should. There won't be as much prosperity as possible. If there's too many laws, that also hurts. And there's always this balance to be struck of um, having private solutions, having laws where laws are necessary, and allowing individuals to come up with solutions to problems as well. We don't believe that the government can solve every problem in society. And we feel very strongly that if the government tries to solve every problem, it will contribute to the downfall of society not even to exaggerate, um, but society can literally fall apart if the government tries to solve all problems. And so we very much want to help empower people to operate in the realm where private solutions are necessary, where government interaction can be harmful, because we don't want government to be active there. But we do want government to be active where laws are necessary, where private solutions aren't enough to solve some of these issues. Yeah, and I think um, to delve even a little further into that, we talk about the good for society being at that fulcrum, that liberty. But I think we could also consider the individual. Um, if you consider an individual that's told to do everything and then just does what they're told, what kind of uh, growth can that individual experience? Um, they they can't improve themselves, and if an individuals and left entirely to themselves, given no direction, kind of an anarchy side. Um, how much of a struggle is it to make good decisions if uh, no one's there to kind of put up some guidelines, some signposts? And so for society to function well, it's good to have a government that um, seeks for the liberty. And then for individuals, I think, to learn and grow, it's good for a government to provide liberty or to protect, excuse me, to protect liberty. Yeah, no, those are great points because in order for a country or community or any of those things to be healthy, to be vibrant, to be prosperous, the individual internally has to be that way. 
a country is only a combination of people. We're all individuals and the foundation of a society is the individual. And if you don't have a healthy individual, you don't have the ability for that individual to feel free, to make choices, to do things, then society will suffer. There's no way for it not to without that individual side of it. And so, yes, as you look at, you know, as you consider this balance that will probably show often in these things, um, in these discussions we have, this balance, you can have anarchy on one side, tyranny on the other. You can have individual on one side, community or society on the other. You can have principles of, um, there's all kinds of competing interests that exist, justice and mercy, where if society is purely just and everything, and there's never mercy that's part of society, it'll probably be too heavy to one side or the other. But when we have this balance in place and the right balance of principles that compete with interests, um, it creates a stable foundation and things can be built, things can thrive. Um, so. To us, the founding fathers were, you know, some of them at least were students of history. We know Madison studied history extensively, looked at governments, and he really pioneered a lot of the plans for the U.S. Constitution. And one of the things that he was very adamant about was the system of checks and balances. And when we think about the seesaw and we think about these balances in place, we have pieces that, um, he was very intentional about looking at and pursuing so that there was um, there was the ability to have competing interests function together and not have one become more powerful than the other. And it was an important piece of the Constitution. It's an important piece of America. And he used humans competing interests to start to be able to um, is a way to propel innovation, a way to propel progression in a number of things. And that's something that we believe very strongly should be kept and should be understood. And so one of the things we love to look at is again, we love to talk about numbers and data. And it's very interesting to start to look at what the system produced. So I think it's always helpful as we evaluate checks and balances, evaluate America to see where it's come. And so, uh, Michael, I think you have some numbers info to start kind of talk about America, where it started compared to some of the things of where we're at today. Yeah, and if we're, you're, you're referring to size and, and population, things like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think last time we, we talked about kind of where America is today as far as the economic growth and prosperity. Um, so it's interesting to look at how it started, given that it was a, um, a part of the, the British Empire and able to you know, fight for its own independence from um, that powerful uh, country at the time. The U.S. started out in 1776 with a population of about two and a half million people. Um, you know, put that in some perspective walmart today worldwide employs about 2.1 million people so walmart was america or is america right that's the way america started two and a half million people um in uh england or excuse me britain at the time they had about eight million people so it was a country trying to be formed about two and a half million people trying to secede from a country about eight million people um the two and a half million is roughly the population of Namibia today, small country in Africa. Today we have, you know, some 330 plus million people. Uh, when America in 1776, when they were fighting for their independence, there's roughly 40 people per square mile. Today, if we include Alaska, and America is a, a very big country, there's 91 people per square mile. So even though we've increased land, uh, the population increased so much that that person per square mile has increased. It's over doubled. Um, Virginia had was the largest state. It had 747,000 people in it. 
There's 8.6 million people in Virginia today. Pennsylvania had 434,000 people. There's 12.96 million people there today. Um, Delaware had 59,000 people, which uh, that's that's smaller than small cities in America today. Um, you can look at cities like New York City that have eight and a half million people in it themselves, you know, over two and a half times the population of what America began at. Um, Wyoming being the smallest populated uh, state today has 578,000 people inside it. So not much smaller than Virginia began. Um, this is, and so lots of, I, I think lots of what uh, was looked at when America was founded was kind of based on their size. They could only really look at how do we govern a people uh, with what they had, two and a half million people. They could certainly look over to Britain and say, well, we could imagine America growing to be eight million people. We can imagine a city like London that at the time had seven, 750,000 people inside of it, um, which was as many as in Virginia. But it's it's hard to to think, how would you imagine if you're in a country of two and a half million people, what a country of 330 million people looks like? There just wasn't a precedent for it in the world at the time. Um, Going back to companies, I mean, Walmart employs 2.1 million people. Amazon employs 1.5 million people. Some of the still large companies, but they don't employ nearly as many people. Google employs 200,000 people. These are all companies that are larger than many of the states that began America. In Back in 1776, there weren't large companies. Incorporation wasn't uh, something that was known, mainly due to the way laws were structured. It wasn't profitable to incorporate. So there weren't large countries, but one of the largest, or excuse me, large companies, but one of the largest companies was the East India Trading Company. It was essentially a branch of the British government. Um, but they had, interestingly, this company had over 200,000 soldiers as of like 1800, which is more than the number of soldiers in the British Army. So they did have some large co uh, companies, but it wasn't really looked at as an incorporation. It was looked at as kind of an arm of the British government. And the British government used, used the East Indian Trading Company to uh, fight a lot of its battles. Um, but so there's, you know, kind of a, a big difference there from where we began and to where we are today. And I think what's fascinating is the principles that they found or they set in place with the Constitution worked for uh, a people of two and a half million, worked very well. And I think today I can still say it works very well for a people of 330 million. Um, we can discuss what, you know, some aspects of that, what maybe not working, but maybe working well. But I think it attests to the fact that a lot of what they built was built on principles and not built on circumstance. They didn't just say, how do I govern two and a half million people? They said, what is the principle behind government? And they try to use that as their guiding light instead of just the size of of the country. Yeah, and that's I think that's a principle. You know, I was listening to someone last week, actually. And it was just in a I was with a group of people and some people were talking about they said I they go, Yeah, we, we kind of idolized the founding fathers, but they were just people. There wasn't anything that special about them. And we kind of need to stop idolizing them. And I certainly think it's wise to not necessarily lift one person over another. Um, but the piece to me that the Founding Fathers that's very fascinating is if you take even before the Constitution came about, American history that I think a lot of people don't fully understand is 1776 comes around. The Americans felt that the British government was tyrannical. They felt that having the king being able to tell them what to do, how much to pay for things, how much taxes they owed, it was really impeding something that these people came to America for. When people came to America, the initial colonies had incredibly high death rates. It wasn't a walk in the park. These people were naturally, I shouldn't say naturally, but the people were inherently, that's the word, inherently searching for something that they weren't finding in Britain. A lot of them had good lives. A lot of them were rich enough to get passage, to do things. But there was a piece of that missing. This individual side was decaying. It wasn't there. 
And the British Empire was huge. It was around the world. And the people said, you know what? We don't want this. And these are the people that came to America that started trying to fulfill this almost experiment of what are they searching for? What are they trying to find? And it reached this kind of critical point in 1776 when they just say, we're done. We're done being subject to the king. We're not going to take this anymore. And we're done to the point where we're willing to die for it. We're willing to let our kids die for it because something inside of us is so hollow, so missing. And that's a piece that I do admire. Someone having enough faith in something to say, I'll die for it. And they did that. And then they fought a war for seven years. Revolutionary War was a seven-year war. We look at things like the war in Ukraine right now, and it's been dragging on for over a year now, I think, or around that. And we're kind of just going, wow, when's this going to end? What's going on? And we look at morale, how it's beat down on both sides, at least if you believe news reports. Um, and you look at that and say, wow, how do people do this? But America somehow stuck through this for seven years against the biggest power in the world at the time. It was, they were worldwide. Again, they had navies. They had all these things that America didn't. And America said, we don't care. Now, certainly it wasn't everybody there. There were people that wanted to stay with Britain, people that liked the luxury that came with that. And there was opposition internally. But all that takes place. The Revolutionary War ends in 1783, seven years after 1776. And the states are so independently minded, so individually minded, so opposed to the tyranny they experienced with the king that they said, we're not going to give any power to a federal government. And they formed this Articles of Confederation. And America quickly devolved into a bad place. And that's when we go back to this balance that we're talking about. If we share the screen again to have this liberty balance here. America was somewhere down here toward close to the anarchy state where, federally speaking, there weren't enough laws. They couldn't keep things in control. Groups were breaking out. Mobs were breaking out. Shays Rebellion happened. So many pieces were falling apart. Courthouses getting burned down because people were just saying, this isn't working. We're starving. We're hungry. Soldiers aren't paid from the war because the states, the government has no power to collect taxes to pay them. Um, and essentially, the founders, again, wanted their individuality to the maximum level. They pursued a path of that and realized after 1783, all society is crumbling when we're too individual in nature. But we also know how painful it was to live under a hand of all law or the king making whatever laws he wanted, us having no say in things. And they didn't want that either. And so come 1787, when they're in constitutional convention talking about what they're going to do, and James Madison proposes that they scrap the Articles of Confederation. He just says, it's doomed. It's not going to work. We have to be willing to give up some of our individuality and some of that that we want so that we can still function together. And this is a fascinating piece to me because in our current rhetoric and discussions, a number of people say, ah, oh, just give up those rights, you know, stop holding on to those, do it for the good of everybody else. And other people say, no, I'm holding on to my rights, you know, come whatever may come, I'm going to hold on to them. I'm not going to give up anything here. And to me, it feels a little bit like the debates that were taking place in America at that time of, oh, let's just stay with the king, things are good, or no, want it all individual. And the checks and balances that came out of this were impressive to me. Um, but it was a process of competing interests, for sure. And I think to your point on the the nature of the founders, um, it's too often I think we focus on individuals in history, how they were like everyone else. We say they weren't that special. Look, they were like everyone else. And it, I think what's typical for any given human is they're a lot like another human. They make a lot of the same mistakes. So I think 
what helps is when we look at, well, what did they do differently? Today, it's, it's common to talk about a fight for freedom or a fight for liberty. That isn't a radical idea. People, yeah, fight for your liberty. Most people agree you should fight for some sort of rights or freedom. Everybody seems to agree on that. That wasn't a, an idea in 1776. It was kind of, it had been written about by a few individuals. But people in countries didn't go around talking like that. That usually result, resulted in being killed by a king of some sort. Um, and now today we talk about it without any fear. We talk about fighting for these rights. And so instead of looking at how the founders were just like every other human being, which they were in many ways, the question is, what did they do differently? Because when you look at the, the few decisions they made that were different, that's where we really start to understand um, what they were fighting for and what they created and how uh, important it is to us today. How, how did they decide on uh, you know, this government? Well, they made some decisions differently than everybody else had in the past. Yeah, and that's a great point. And so that it also brings us to what Madison proposed, which is he came to them and said, we need a stronger federal government. That sorry, states have to give up some stuff. Which is kind of radical to these people that just said, I don't want a king, right? They. They don't want a stronger central government. Yep. And so Madison's proposal was to say, look, there's basics here. They get on this balance scale. We've got to move closer to the liberty because we're too far on the anarchy side. He says there's no way. He says all that Britain's doing is they're just waiting for America to fall apart. They know we're all starting to fight with each other. They know that we can't trade with each other. They know that we're not thriving. Our economy's crumbling. We know that we have to buy everything from them. We're relying on them for it all. And we need to solve this problem. And so this is where, to me, the discussion becomes very important to always be able to discuss, is the problem at hand one the government can and should solve or that more government can help with? Or is it a problem that needs individual solution? Because when Madison came in, he proposed that we needed some additional government. And... <clears throat> And so again, when we talk about the genius of where he's at today, I think most people say, ooh, back off government. You know, we don't want government solutions. Or people say, we want the government to solve everything. I hear it often in the news. It's usually when something bad happens, the first question is, where's the government? Why'd the government fail us? And I'm going, mm, uh, that sounds like we're approaching the side of tyranny where we want the law to solve everything. Governments only function through law, through force, through police. And do we really want that? Do you really understand what that society looks like, where the law is the solution for everything? But I, I rarely hear people talk about it from the perspective of, well, with this issue, is it an issue of one that needs some laws to help solve because it's an anarchy type thing? Or is it more um, that there's too many laws and it's hurting? And so Madison, though, going in is making this pitch that to these people who just fought off and died and were willing to die for less government, he comes in and says, uh, I struck the balance wrong. We need some more government. And his proposal was to them, he said, well, one way I'm going to try and sell you on this is that the government's going to have some checks on it, so it can't just do whatever it wants. And so he proposes a main system of internally at the federal government level. So when we talk about federal government, we're talking about the government over all of America. And he proposes an internal system of checks and balances. And the Constitution inherently sets up some external protections, too, we'll talk about in a minute, um, or allows some of those to continue to function. But one is internally, there was the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. And so within its three functions there, executive is the president, president's essentially the CEO, and the executive branch is charged with enforcing the laws in America. But the president is not supposed to make the laws because they didn't want one person to be able to make laws that looked too much like a king. Um, and they had debates about the president, whether there should be multiple ones, you know, what that should look like. They went through all these things, but eventually decided 
we'll have one person in charge of enforcing the laws. And then the legislative branch is the one that makes laws. They are a group of elected officials. They have to get majority vote. The Senate currently at the federal level needs 60% vote based on their own internal rules to get things through. And both houses have to approve it. And even then, one of the things, while the president doesn't make the law, doesn't get to decide on the text inside it and all that, and then has to go to the president for either signing or vetoing where he disapproves of it. And so that was also a balance where the executive branch could balance the legislative. If they were too crazy on something, the president could say no. Um, the third branch that was created, this third balance, was the judicial branch, the courts. And it's interesting because in the constitutional system that was created, the court's role wasn't expressly stated in the Constitution itself. It was, I think it's a little unclear whether it was an oversight, whether it was intentionally left out. <laughs> um, but the president and the legislative, how the legislature was set up, got a lot of focus. Um, and so that's just a high level real quick on those. We'll go into those a little bit more. But then some external checks and balances that exist on the federal government are the states. Constitution expressly recognized the states. And the states were supposed to have their own interests, things they pursued. They were supposed to have their own rights, their own powers that the federal government wasn't to take from them. And they could act as a balance to some of the powers of the feds. And that was important to convince these states to go along with this federal government, where they weren't just creating a kingship again. They were guaranteed certain rights, responsibilities, and all that. And then within the state, this isn't directly referenced in the Constitution, but it's something that was a system, I think, that helped perpetuate. The states divide into local governments, county, city, smaller levels. And just as a quick note on that, it's important to note the county level in almost every state runs the elections and the county governments are responsible for the presidential election in America, which is fascinating to look at. Fascinating kind of check and balance that's arisen through the system and the way things are set up. And so you have literally thousands of governing bodies that meet and make rules and do different things to determine the outcome of a presidential election. It's a very interesting check and balance that exists. Um, and then the Constitution also left certain rights to the people that federal government can take away. And when the Constitution started, only the federal government was banned from taking away those rights. States could still take away those rights um, at the individual level. And that changed with the 14th Amendment that came after the Civil War when they expanded those rights to bind the states as well, to say the state couldn't take those rights away from you either because they experienced some conflicts with that. With the people realm of a check and balance, one of the things that exists is a check and balance that gets a lot of bad lip in today's media, but that is an interesting balance is business. As individuals combine together, they create groups, they create businesses. And together, those people interact. And business is also an external check and balance on government as well. Um, and I'd say actually pretty important one because they bring a lot of things to light and they have incentives to do it. They have the money to do it. And obviously there can be too much business involved in government. There can be money controlling things. Again, there's a need constantly for a check and balance where one doesn't overpower the other. But those are important ones to have. Yeah, and I, I think uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that the founders weren't intending to create a democracy, as much as we like to talk about that today. And this is part of the checks and balances because they felt that a pure democracy would just lead to tyranny of the majority. Uh, and so a check on kind of the, the bullying nature of just the majority of people saying something and taking away rights was, well, it's not going to be a pure democracy. There are a lot of democratic elements 
to what we do in our voting, both at the federal level and at the local level. Uh, but the fact that all these different checks exist, you know, the uh, president appointing um, justices, but not everybody's voted directly by the people. Um, these, these are all ways to check on just the overwhelming nature of a majority of the people that to ensure that even minority individuals get to keep rights. Uh, so another check was, let's not create a pure democracy. We, we want government by the people, but you can't give just the people all the power. I think that's kind of what another side of that is. Yeah, and you talk about tyranny, the majority. Obviously, the word tyranny gets used in a couple of contexts. But I think in this context, it would mean the majority decides everything. Right. They become like a king. And it's just, well, if you're with the in crowd today, cool. But tomorrow, if you're not, too bad for you. You can lose everything. And one of the tyrannies of the majority is that they can simply vote to take your property. Right. And we talked last time a little bit about how private property laws are part of the foundational nature of what has made America what it is. And the fact that the majority can't simply just vote to say, oh, you got something we want, we'll take it, um, has created an intense protection for America and is something that helps to fuel its growth. And the same with minorities, that if you look through the past, many different groups have been in the minority in the past. Catholics, when they started here, were hated. Um, you look at LGBTQ crowd, they had a hatred. They had other things they had to go through. Blacks, all these people who are, all of these groups, whether they're religious, whether they're ethnic, whether they're cultural, whether it's you know lifestyle that people don't like or whatever it is that's involved. Um, America said, we recognize the value you bring and we very much want to protect you from this tyranny of just having the majority say, we don't like you, we'll just vote you out. And because they, they saw very readily that the majority could be swayed to do things that were evil, that were wrong, that were bad. They looked at slavery, slavery was there. Slavery was a debated topic in the Constitutional Convention. Um, and right or wrong, most I think felt they had to compromise some on that to say, we'll never be able to create a country if we don't bend a little on this, but both sides bent. It led to the cessation of the slave trade. And then they still had to though go to war to fight that, to totally overcome that issue. Um, but again, just going back to this principle of, like you say, it's a republic. Even the people had to check on them. Where we couldn't just go, mm, there's 50% of us or 51% of us, we got gotcha. you. The people were checked, states were checked, federal government was checked, businesses are checked. There's a check on everyone and everything in the system. And it's very fluid and moving of how all that works. And it's fascinating to look at a system where, you know, we look at the president as kind of the head, but the president can get voted out but not for four years. You know, we're kind of stuck with who we vote for for four years. And Supreme Court justices can be appointed by the president, but they have to be approved by the Senate. And all these different pieces, these little pieces put in place so that one group didn't have full control. The people, we don't have full control in America because we have to elect representatives. Representatives don't have full control because they can get voted out. They have the judicial branch involved with it. Um, and so that is certainly a genius of our system. And as we talk about laws and we talk about America and even issues in America, I think it's helpful to always talk about what's the check. If we're gonna create any solution or create any more government for anything, you should never do it unless there's a proper check in place. Same with rights on the people. If the people have rights, those are checked with responsibilities. And if we don't live up to our responsibilities, what happens? What's the check in place? You know, what starts to occur because of that? And I think people like to point out um, problems in America's past when we didn't correctly handle um, rights given to individuals. 
all kinds of minorities. We can point at all kinds of minority groups that were uh, treated improperly at one point or another. And people like to point that out as a failure. Um, but I think the the failure is in the very at the very end. What did we do? Did we, you know, battle it out as a country and come to the right solution? Or are we coming to the right solution? You know, there's always work to be done. I don't think you can look at any one situation and say we're going to figure it out just as fast as you can say it. Um, there's a lot that goes into a lot of people that need to have input. And so when you look at problems in America's past, they can't just be pointed at the failures. We didn't stop there. We didn't just say, yep, we got slavery. We're, we're here now and it's still here. We fought as a country for a very long time, eventually fought a, a war to get rid of it. So what is America's, uh, what is our track record essentially in fighting to overcome problems that we've experienced? And it's, uh, it's always one of, hey, here's a problem. What are we going to do about it? And it takes a while. It can take time. But we're always working to try to better that and to provide liberty to individuals. It's not a failure that we had it. It would be a failure if we just left it, I think, is the way to look at it. Yeah, and it's a great point because, you know, with where the country started, we even have, I hear it often about people talking about giving land back because we stole it from the Indians or whatnot. And I, I look at that and go, but do we really understand where the world was then? That's how everything happened. Everything at that time was the mighty took it from the weak. It was just a doggy dog world. And yes, that doesn't mean it was right, but there was nothing else taking place. There were no other options to go through. Society, civilizations hadn't developed to the point where that was an option. And now when we look back at it, now that we have options that have been given to us because of the genius of America and the genius of what's taken place, we're very critical of past situations saying, how dare you? How horrible that there were slaves here. Yeah, that's a bad thing. Absolutely. But that was the economy of the world at the time. And it wasn't just that blacks were slaves. Countries around the world have made other groups slaves. And slavery was an issue. Slavery still is an issue. It's very, businesses can exploit it. Money always wants it. It's one of the checks we're still trying to put in place. Human trafficking exists where children are sold as sex slaves, other things. And there's a ton of money with it. And so, yes, there needs to be some checks there. There needs to be some balances in place. But like you say, simply because there was an issue doesn't mean that the people of that day and age were horrible people. It means, wow, they worked through it. I look at things with claims of pollution, climate change, other pieces. And my wife made the comment a little while ago. She said, you know, she goes, people in 30 years are going to look back at us and say how horrible we were for driving a gas vehicle that we just destroyed the planet. We were such immoral people for driving a gas vehicle. And she said, but, you know, this was, she had said this a little prior to the electric vehicles really coming down. And I know people can have their debates about whether electric vehicles are good or not, or whether they pollute just as much with all the mining and whatever that takes place. But to say, but if you want to exist in today's society, if you don't have a ton of choices in most places. You need something to get around. That's just how it exists. And we're trying to overcome pollution as a society. I think no matter what people feel about climate change, most can agree pollution's not great. What can we do to solve that? And America is aggressively working on that. And it is very fascinating to see what world and societal issues have been overcome as a result of the system that enables good people to be able to pursue the truths they see. And yes, there's people that resist it. There's people that don't want it. But to see the process play out time and time again and to see good happen is very compelling to me where I say, yes, that's that's the system I want to be in. Because as humans, we'll always have issues. We'll always have weaknesses. What do we do with them? And I like that mindset quite a bit. Um, so as we look at this, to dive a little bit more into government systems, we have federal government, executive, legislative, judicial. One of the important things about the legislative branch to understand at the federal level, how it was set up originally, 
is that there is a House of Representatives. So the legislative body that makes laws is divided into two camps. House of Representatives represents the people. It's voted based on population. Currently in our government, I think there's 435 elected officials. And that gets reapportioned every 10 years in America based on where population goes. So right now, after COVID, we've had a lot of population movement. So come 2030 census, we may have some states lose representatives and some states gain representatives, potentially, with how much population has changed. Um, but that's always apportioned out by population. And so some states have very few representatives. States like Wyoming probably have one, I'd imagine. Um, Utah, I think, has four. California's got 50 something, I think, um, out of the 435 that are there. And they each represent people is what they're supposed to represent. The government, one of the checks and balances in place is that only the House of Representatives can propose, can propose laws to increase taxes. Um, as they always wanted those tax bills to, to start with people that were representatives who are supposed to represent the people's interests, meaning we're only going to tax you to the extent necessary. Um, on the other side in the Senate, Madison was actually against this for quite some time, but the Senate gives two representatives per state. So every state has equal representation in the Senate. And this was part of the compromise that took place. I actually think it was a very good compromise that ended up taking place. Because what it did is each state at the time were groups of people with very different ideas, very different pursuits, very different beliefs. And it gave them each an equal say in the government where one couldn't overpower the other. So it helped to stop this kind of tyranny of the majority thing where just the majority rules. Because the tyranny of the majority could still occur through elected representatives if there wasn't something else in place in the Senate system said we're going to take representatives from different groups that have different interests give them all equal footing and make them work together and so the senate and the house both had a passings now currently in america we have an amendment that changed the voting on the senate because states used to select their senators and a state the two senators were supposed to go represent the state's interests which meant a bill to pass had to how to appease the people's interests and how to appease the state's interests in order to give that power to the federal when government. When you say state, you mean the state government, right? The state government was sending those senators. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The state government got to choose those. And each state got to select how they did that, what they did. Um, but it made it so the Senate was there to protect the state's interests. And that was a check on laws that came into place because it had to align the state's interest and the people's interest. So essentially both had to agree, yeah, this is something we need the federal government for, if there was to be a law on that. And yes, we agree this is a good solution. So, and I think that worked very well. But when the amendment was passed in the early 1900s, it said senators are gonna be direct, directly elected by the people now. And so every state now had two senators elected by the majority of the people, which, to me, didn't still doesn't fully make sense of why we did that as America. Um, I don't know enough of that history to know why the states approved that and gave that up. I know there were some corruption issues that people were concerned about, but they essentially just kind of walked away from that and said, yeah, we're sick of appointing people. There's bribes. There's all this underhanded stuff going on. So just give it to the people. And so currently we have a system where the Senate and the House still have to agree. They're both elected by the people. But because every state only has two senators, um, it makes it so that more minority groups can actually have a stronger say in the federal government, which has made it so that in recent years, people are upset going, look, America is not all majority this way, but the Senate represents more of a minority approach. Um, but again, one of the things that's doing is it's forcing this conversation of what is the right approach? We don't want too much federal government. Um, is there a balancing here? Um, but even then, I personally feel that both parties are leaving a system of less government and both parties are moving to a system of, we need the government to solve our problems. Um, they're just 
focusing on different problems, I think, that they're pushing the government to solve. But currently, our two parties, Republican and Democrat, pass an incredible number of laws, and many of them go through unanimous or very close to unanimous, where there's just a high percentage of everyone just agreeing, yep, 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 more laws, more laws, more laws. And I don't see this balanced approach to saying, hmm, should the government be approaching this issue or not? Um, so a little bit deeper dive too into the court system. The Constitution didn't spell out the courts, didn't spell out exactly what the Supreme Court was going to do. It allowed the Congress to create inferior courts to appoint things besides the Supreme Court. And I think Congress took that pretty seriously. They did create a pretty strong court system. They created trial courts, they created appellate courts. Um, and I think Mo America's courts have served as a model for quite a while. We're at a place now where there's so many rules and so many rights that court processes are lengthy. They're incredibly expensive. I do think there's some balancing we need to come back to with the court system. But overall, the Constitution talked about the Supreme Court. The president got to appoint the Supreme Court justices. And so very early in America's career as a nation, we get to a very interesting place. The Constitution was first signed in 1787. I think it, uh, it took until 89 to be fully ratified by all the states. President Washington at the time signs in a bill that's passed by both houses of Congress, you know, presumably includes quite a few founding fathers in this process. And it's the Judiciary Act of 1789. And they make this law to fill out some of the stuff with the courts. Well, um, early 1800s, we're at a place where the parties are still, the different groups and interests are still fighting quite a bit. And I think it's Thomas Jefferson is leaving office. Um, or is, sorry. Um, Adams, I think, was leaving office with Jefferson coming in. And they he made a bunch of midnight appointments of officials. And so when Jefferson comes around, um, and this is right before he's done. So meaning he appoints these people and says, you're going to be in there. You're going to make things difficult for Jefferson because we don't agree. And Jefferson comes in and says, I'm not following that. You know, I'm not going to pay you, not going to appoint you. And Marbury, one of them, sues um, Madison. So the case is Marbury versus Madison. I think Madison had the duty to fulfill these appointments based on his position at the time. And he sues and says, hey, the Judiciary Act of 1789 says I can sue directly in the Supreme Court, bring this case to you. And I was given an appointment by a sitting president. I didn't get it. I didn't get paid. So Supreme Court, tell Jefferson he's got to follow through with this. And the Supreme Court's in this bind. It's a pretty tough spot for a young country to be in because the Supreme Court knows very well Jefferson's not the obedient type. If they go, hey, Jefferson, yep, you need to give him that. They know Jefferson's just going to essentially give him the middle finger and say no. Um, and they know that if that's the case, if they start this precedent from the beginning that, well, the president doesn't like what we did, um, you know, that Supreme Court's going to be essentially meaningless. There won't be much there for them. So as they're looking at trying to figure out what to do, um, they have pretty wise chief justice at the time. And he's trying to reconcile all the competing interests, look at everything. And so his solution to the problem is, he says, hey, America. Yeah, technically, Marbury's right. The law says he's supposed to do this. The law says he's supposed to get this. All that's there. But guess what? We don't have the constitutional authority to tell the president what to do. In this case, because the Judiciary Act of 1789 is unconstitutional. And the Judiciary Act of 1789 
is unconstitutional because it says you can start this case here. You actually can't. The Constitution says those are supposed to be in the lower courts. And um, but to hold that the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional, that makes sense to us today. But that was the thing expressly argued. It says, you know, Marbury said, you can't decide what's constitutional or not. You just have to follow the law. The Constitution didn't give you the authority to do this judicial review. And the Supreme Court went through this thing where they found the power existed for them to determine what's constitutional and what's not. So what that did is it put Jefferson in a spot of loving the decision on the merits where they weren't going to tell him to give this people their appointments and their compensation. But he had to choose if he was now going to accept the fact that the Supreme Court had the authority to do judicial review which he hadn't agreed on before. And so they kind of put it back into this camp of saying, hey, Jefferson, we're handing you kind of this win, but you got to give us something to an exchange. You got to give us this power and respect the fact that we can do this. And it was this fascinating power struggle. It's, it's fascinating to see almost a blessing of how this issue came to be. And then looking at it, because as Jefferson looked at it as president, as the Supreme Court looked at it, they each paired back a little, but they also each took something. And um, and since then, the Supreme Court has fully been recognized as having the role of judicial authority and judicial review on constitutional issues, which means they can tell the president now or the governor of a state, you have to allow gay marriage in your state. In Marbury versus Madison's time, if the Supreme Court told any sitting governor or any sitting president to do something, they all would have said no. And what are you going to do about a Supreme Court? Today, the judicial re power of judicial review exists and is considered an important check and balance. But it's one that's interesting. Again, the Constitution didn't specifically address it, and we don't have a lot of balance back. So if the court goes kind of crazy and pushes this constitutional stuff too much, there's not a great check or balance on that currently. And one reason there's not a great checker balance is because it wasn't addressed in the Constitution. They didn't right. specifically think this through. Yeah, and and it's an interesting dynamic because just to highlight, the judicial branch doesn't have, they're not given any power to enforce their finding, right? If they find something, in, in this case, we can talk about judicial review, they find something not constitutional. They rely on the other branches to then do something about it. And so it's an interesting dynamic between them to where they they say this is the way it should be and the only way that has any power is if the other branches say yep you said it therefore it's true and uh so it provides that that was kind of the case back with marbury versus madison they're like what if we tell jefferson he has to pay he, he's not going like you said he's not going to because the judicial branch can't force they can't remove him from office they don't have any power and so it creates an interesting power struggle between the branches. Yeah, and it's a power struggle the courts knew they would lose. Right. And so what they decided to go on and build their power on was, and this is expressed, they're actually very express about this in future cases. They say that the whole power or legitimacy of the court rests in the deference that people give it based on the fact that people view it as wise. And the Supreme Court is known for years and years and years, hundreds of years, that they have to be the wisest, most cautious, most respected branch in America in order to have any type of power or sway because they don't have any to point back to in the Constitution. They have no army to enforce anything with. And so they've operated under that. And so in recent years, when we have the court coming under so much attack and it being so politicized, to say, oh, let's get a certain president and to appoint certain judges or this or that, and the Senate having their fights. You know, the first time the Senate really fought over appointment for Supreme Court was, I think, in the 1980s. Um, and it was a shocking thing for America to finally have an appointment get rejected based on political ideologies. And it was the place where I think certain powers recognized that America could fall if they could disrupt this check and balance in place. They could throw things off. And so we're currently, a lot of forces, I believe, 
if we're working to destroy good in America and some of the checks and balances by attacking the, the legitimacy of the court. And granted, the court takes some of those things, they wade into some issues that maybe they shouldn't. And there is a, you know, often, it's often reported in the news, oh, these were along party lines or these decisions were this or that. The news doesn't like to report when the court doesn't go along party lines, when they hold opposite to that. And that still happens quite a bit, but the court is losing legitimacy in America's eyes. And as it does, one of the foundational values in America that's helped America operate for many years is being eroded because there's nothing expressed in place. We're operating on the system of respect. As soon as the president decides one day, I'm not going to follow the Supreme Court. There's nothing in place to enforce any of that. Um, Congress may be able to try and impeach the president or something. But at the end of the day, if they can't agree on that, if it's all political, America is just kind of sitting there. And then we start to lose rights. We start to lose these checks and balances that are in place. And so we talk about this to say, we as a people need to understand that respect is a foundational value in American government. Respect is one of the pieces that keeps the Constitution together, that keeps the whole thing functioning. And we as individuals, if we work on having more respect in our lives, respect for offices, respect for people, respect for neighbors, citizens, other things, we are very much supporting and strengthening one of the foundational values that makes America work. Without respect, there is no America. It will simply fall apart. Yeah, and along the lines of respect, I think we'll get into this in further episodes. Um, but to talk about what our responsibility as individuals, what all those responsibilities are, and we talk about how America works and why it's been so great. Uh, and we can't just talk about this establishment of the government in order to make that puzzle work. We also have to talk about individuals and the choices they make and the responsibilities they've taken. And so on the point of respect, you can see that it's really lost today for the courts or any elected representative that isn't after your persuasion. Uh, it's. Everybody just talks badly about everybody. It's accepted. If you're if you're a public official, your name will be smeared. Anything bad that you could have possibly done will probably be put out in public for everybody to see. And then everybody can, you know, yell at you or whatever the case is. They're they're some of the most disrespected individuals. And I'm not arguing that they they're all making very respectable decisions. I think we can discuss what their decisions are. But I think you can talk about somebody's decision without what being good or bad without demeaning the individual themselves and i think we try to need to get we need to try to get back to that more where we're saying we don't agree with these decisions but it doesn't mean i'm going to demean the person it demeans the the uh office they hold it demeans the government it makes everything meaningless and then where's the power in in american government at that point yeah and that is something we will try very hard to focus on is this individual responsibility side, because when we talk about these different places, you know, America is what it is and made it to a certain place. The government is a piece of this story, like you say, but the people are such an integral part of the government. And again, it comes back to this individual nature. What were individuals doing? Why do we say that things are different in today's society? And certainly we can fill. There's two things that I think that we can fill as we talk about this. Some people hear these things and say, oh, well, if America needs respect, we've lost all hope. And my efforts aren't going to do anything because it takes millions of people having respect and that's not going to work. I have zero hope of changing those people, so I'm just giving up. That's not the message that we are working to encourage with teaching us information and talking about these things. Respect in America. The, one of the amazing things about our government and our system in America as a whole is that America can operate on the backs of a few good people. 
it did that during the Revolutionary War. It did that with the, what a lot of what's taking place um, up through time, uh, building things, doing things. There were many bad people in America for a very long time. Religious groups were intensely persecuted, killed, slaves beaten, killed, abused. Um, there was all kinds of bad. And people never gave up working on things. And one of the things that America does, the system does, is that even if the majority refuses to do something, the minority still has certain rights and protections in place. And so even if we're in the minority as a people that try to be respectful, we can build that into our interactions. And the system we have enables good people to still have a lot of power and influence. It certainly enables some bad to take place um, as well if we're not acting on our responsibilities and doing things. But we sincerely hope that as you go through this series of podcasts and discussions, that you recognize don't ever believe it takes 51% of America in order for something to happen. You have the power to do a lot because the system has individual rights. And when those individual rights exist, that empowers you to do something for America because the government can't take those away from you. And that's something that means the majority can't take it away from you and that you can literally stop inappropriate actions of a majority because of the rights that you have. And we want people to understand their place, their purpose, to understand what's good, what's worth standing up for, to understand how to do it. And one of the pieces that we will consistently push is this respect piece that we never have to tear a human down to get what we want or what we need. We should always focus on people as people, but be very open about the ideas, very open about the actions. Um, and to be able to separate those two and act in that way. So it's a very good point. Um, so we're at a place where we have right about an hour. We have some examples to go through on these, but we'll probably wait till the next podcast to do that, where we delve some into, we thought we'd explore some of the checks and balances that have existed, whether they were good or bad, how they shook out by looking through the lens of COVID. In America today, when COVID came through, we'll talk about some actual laws that were passed or actions by governors or the president. See some, there was some legislative pushback, some business pushback, some judicial pushback, some individual pushback. And obviously, people are going to have a different opinion about whether some of the pushback was right or wrong. But overall, we want to look at the big picture, how it shook out. Was it good or bad? And are we better off or worse off as a result of that? So we'll talk, delve more into the COVID stuff um, to view these principles through, again, a real life situation. We can look at some other situations too um, that we'll go through, but we'll try and make next the next one about specifics of these principles to kind of see them in action. So we appreciate your time with us today. Um, and we'll continue exploring these concepts, exploring what's made America what it is. And we look forward to doing that more with you. Thanks so much.